So here's what we're talking about. Uh, we're going to jump heavily into capacitors today. Let me uh, review some of the basics that I, I talked about last time. Um, a capacitor is basically a start, uh, is an energy storage device. Initially, you just have two uh, neutral uh, conducting plates. Um, but if you connect the capacitor to a battery, the battery basically serves as a pump to get charge off of one plate and put it on the other. So what happens is, since we pretend positive charge carriers are where the action is, even though that's not really true, positive charges, charge carriers get pulled off of this plate, put onto this one, and before long we have equal and opposite charge on these plates. Um, now, where does it end? Where does the charge pro uh, uh, charging stop? Well, it's when the positive plate has become the same voltage as the positive terminal, and the negative plate has become the same voltage as the terminal it's connected to, then there ceases to be any energetic motivation for charges to further crowd on these plates. Okay? So basically, there's now two equipotential regions in the circuit, this one and this one, and that's when the process is over. And what that basically means is that the battery has taken the two formerly neutral plates, which had no voltage difference, of course, at all, and it's charged it until the voltage across the capacitor becomes the same as the battery voltage. And that takes putting charge on these plates to make their voltage difference grow. The amount of charge we can get on each plate, first of all, it is, of course, proportional to the charging voltage. So, for instance, um, if you attach a, a given capacitor to a 1,000 volt battery, that's going to put more charge on the plates until the voltage difference is 1,000 volts than if you just connected a given capacitor to a 2 volt battery. You don't need that much charge to go on the plates before the voltage difference is 2 volts. So the amount of charge is proportional to the voltage. If you, for instance, if you double the voltage, the charging voltage, you'll double the amount of charge on each plate. Um, but that doesn't mean that every capacitor that you might grab out of a box will have the same exact charge put on it by the same battery. There is also a proportionality constant called the capacitance. So that, let me flip this relation around, the capacitance is a rating for the particular device which tells you how much charge will this store per volt of effort. Okay, so the way I like to think of it is it's the amount of charge stored and then the, of course the denominator is the charging voltage, so that's the amount of effort. Okay. So that's our way to rate these devices and again I want to convey that there's no such thing as being uh, we don't want to rate it as total amount of charge stored because there's no maximum limit to the amount of charge stored. It depends on how hard you try. If you filled something completely, quote unquote, with a two volt battery, if you attached a thousand volt battery, it would put more charge. So there's, there's no magic amount for how much is stored, it's just how much can you store per effort. So to give you an analogy, let's say instead of rating this perhaps weird, unfamiliar electrical device. Let's say we rate another storage device, a closet, okay? So you and your friend are having an argument about who has the better closet, okay? That's the storage device that stores clothes instead of energy, okay? And instead of energy and charge, it stores clothes, okay? So, you make a bet. Your, your bet is going to be, okay, my closet is better, it can store more clothes, okay? And you think you have it in the bag because you have this nice giant walk-in closet and your friend, you know that the friend has this tiny little closet, okay? So you know uh, when you both go home you, and you're going to report back how many clothes you stored, you know you're going to come out on top, right? You've got a nice big walk-in closet just casually putting stuff in there knowing there's no way that your friend could get this much in their closet. My closet's going to be better. Little do you know that your friend has rented a trash compactor and they've taken all their clothes and compressed it into a brick like this, okay, and put a bunch of those bricks into their closet, and they come back and they say, I actually stored more clothes than you, to which you would rightly cry foul because that seems not fair, right? 
you guys should both agree on the amount of effort you're willing to put into it. And part of that effort is no trash compactors allowed, okay? So this really is the best way to rate any kind of storage is to not just talk about the amount stored, but put some kind of limit on the effort that you're willing to put into that, okay? So um, hopefully that makes a perfectly sensible um, description of why you'd want to rate a storage device this, device this way. There's no limit to the amount of charge you can store, but if you divide by the effort, then there is, right? So for a given storage device, if you connect a 9-volt battery or a 1,000-volt battery, whatever, there's always going to be a certain amount of charge that you can store per every volt that you're, of effort that you're going to put in. Which means that the units of capacitance, in our case, what do we measure a charge in? Coulombs. So we have to be careful here because there's actually two different usages of the letter C here in very close proximity. Um, C as a variable means coulombs, that's the unit of charge. What C as a variable, right, not a unit, but a variable means capacitance. Um, what do we measure voltage in? Volts. Volts, okay. So the units of capacitance are coulombs per volt. How many coulombs can we store per volt of effort? This gets a name. It's called a ferret. The units of capacitance are ferrets. A one ferret capacitor is actually a very, very good capacitor. It can store one coulomb of charge, which we said was a lot, right? One coulomb is a lot of charge. But it can do it for one volt of effort. So that's storing a lot of charge for very little effort. It used to be that I would have to report to you that the uh, one ferret capacitor is like the size of a football field. Okay? Nowadays, the technology has gotten so good, we do have ones that you can hold in your hand. Okay? The way they do that, by the way, is by some really crazy trickery, which I'll get into um, a little bit. But um, for normal capacitors, we're talking microfarads, uh, nanofarads, even picofarads, which 10 to the minus 12. Uh, you know, fer ferret is not a normal amount of capacitance, just like one coulomb is not a normal amount of charge. Okay. Okay. So that is um, kind of the fundamental definition of what capacitance is. Capacitance is how much charge you can store per volt of effort. This is kind of the equivalent of Ohm's law, right? So Ohm's law, E equals I R was a fundamental relationship which describes the kind of what a resistor does in its op operation in the circuit, right? So uh, in, a, in Ohm's law, the voltage drop across it, of course, um, gives the motivation for the charges to burrow through the obstruction. And we rate the obstruction R by how much current will actually be able to pass at that motivation level, right? So, if you present the voltage drop across it, how much or how little charge will stream through, that's the current, well that depends on the resistance. The, uh, for this, the voltage drop across it is not so that the charges can pass through. Instead of current, which is the flow of charge, we just have that the charge accumulates, right? So there's a relationship between the voltage across the capacitor and the amount of charge that you can put on it. And the thing that describes that is the capacitance. Okay. And by the way, I guess I should mention that very shortly we'll have both of these things in a circuit. So we should differentiate between the voltage across the capacitor and the voltage across the resistor. So um, not quite yet, but very shortly we'll have to make that distinction if we have both of those. Um, so just like with Ohm's law, of course, we learned that the resistance of something is determined by its physical properties. How is it constructed? Right? So just to remind you what that equation was, the resistance of something is determined by these physical properties. So let's look at what are the physical properties of a capacitor that determine uh, its capability to store charge or not. Okay? So, um, this is also 
a dependent on how it's constructed. So here, just like I gave you some formula for, for the resistance, I'm going to have to give you the formula for capacitance. This is for one specific type of capacitor called a parallel plate capacitor. There are, there are other types. We'll, we'll focus pretty much exclusively on this one. So this is kind of, I've already been drawing it. It looks like this. It's literally just two conducting plates. And let me give you the formula. For what determines the capacitance. So, what are the things uh, in this equation? Um, a is the surface area of the plates. They're identical, so the surface area of each of them is identical, and uh, that's A. Okay. And then D is there the separation of the two plates from each other. And then this is a constant. I know I'm using the Greek letter epsilon, which we've been usually using for battery voltage, which is over here. It's not the same thing. It's just a different usage of the same Greek letter. It's a, just a physical constant. I guess let me start with the physical constant. It's not even a new physical constant. It's a repackaging of an old one. Um, It's 1 over 4 pi times Coulomb's constant. So if you wanted to, you could write it, instead of that epsilon naught, you could just, in the numerator, you could put a 4 pi k in the denominator. Then we wouldn't have to introduce a new constant, but it would be more writing, OK? Similarly with Coulomb's law, right? k q1 q2 over r squared, you could write it in terms of this. this is just a different way to talk about the same constant. Okay? And usually we just choose whichever one is more compact. Okay? And in this case, this is the first formula that I think is more compact with the epsilon naught constant, so we'll use this instead of with k. You can compute for yourself what this is. Of course, if you just take 1 over 4 pi times 9 to the 9th, 9 times 2 to the 9th, um, you can get this number. 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12, no surprise. If we divide by 9 to the, times 10 to the 9, it's going to be quite small. And then the units, of course, are going to be the inverse units of whatever the units are of k, which, which leads us to this. Um, this constant also has a name. If k was just kind of generically Coulomb's constant, because it's in the front of Coulomb's law, this one gets a, a name as well. It's called the permissivity of free space. Sometimes you'll hear it called a permittivity. So I guess sometimes the two S's will be replaced with two T's. Okay. Now that sounds like a very tantalizing name. Why would you call it that? We'll learn later on in the course why it's called that. But for right now, don't worry about it. I just want to plant that seed. Um, for right now, just understand that all of our electric formulas are going to have k or epsilon naught in them. That's kind of the, the deal, right? That's some constant that always goes when there's an electric field or electric phenomenon involved. Okay? And, and again, they're just different ways to package the same constant. Okay? OK, so we got that out of the way, the constant. Now let's look at the variables that could actually be up to you in your construction of the capacitor. One of the things that you immediately notice is that if the area of each plate increases, what happens to the capacitance? Increases. Increases. Now in my closet analogy, that makes perfect sense, right? You want to talk about a closet being better, right? Storing more clothes for effort. One of the ways it's better is it's bigger, right? Well, same thing here. If the plates are bigger, larger area, then the charge has more room to spread out. Okay? 
And if it has more room to spread out, the voltage buildup won't be as fast. You're going to have to put more charge on there before it builds up to the, the battery voltage. Okay? So this is just more room to spread out. We don't put these charges in some tiny little pen, right, where we cram them in there. We have lots of room to spread out. And if you have more room to spread out, you have a better storage device. And again, the capacitance being larger means you can store more charge per effort, more charge per volt. So that one is the obvious one. That is, of course, perfectly analogous to my closet example, but the other factor is not. So here we're going to have to leave that your bet with you and your friend about closets behind and just kind of try our best to motivate. One of the other things you see, um, if you want to make your capacitance better, what should you do to the plate separation? B. You should make it smaller. <coughs> Now here, I'm going to try to sort of hand wavily, uh, wavily prove this, but again, um, I don't want to dwell on it too much because I don't think it's that instructive. So why is it that putting the plates closer together uh, makes the storage device better? It's, it's kind of hard to motivate, but one thing that I will go back to, you guys learned about the relationship between electric field and voltage, right? An electric field talks about the stronger the electric field is, it's because the slope or, or um, change in the voltage over distance is more precipitous. If the voltage changes rapidly over a short distance, then the electric field will be larger. Um, this formula is useful in its own right, so let's adapt it to um, our current circumstances. Of course, we haven't called delta V delta V in a long time. For the entire circuits discussion, we've called just the voltage drop from one place to the other, V. In this case, we also know um, what is the uh, distance over which the voltage drops is, of course, the V, the plate separation. So with that in mind, um, let's examine two scenarios, one in which the capacitor as the plates close together, and one where the plates are further apart. And let's find out why is it that that one, I guess I should do them in the opposite order so we can see why it gets better. So, so why is this worse, and why is this better storage device? Okay. So this has a lower capacitance, and this has a larger capacitance. And again, I'm going to do this um, somewhat hand wavy, but um, I'll do my best to motivate this. Now, if I connect these two capacitors to the same battery, right? It's the same, I don't know, 9 volt battery, right? The whole deal is that if I connect both of these capacitors to a 9 volt battery, the 9 volt battery will bring the voltage difference between both plates up to 9 volts, and then the charging is done, right? So V in this case is going to be fixed. But, according to this formula, if we have a certain voltage difference, say 9 volts, but it's a very rapid change, right, in a short distance, if we lower the plate separation, what does that do to the electric field? It increases, right? So this implies a larger electric field. So if I draw in the electric fields in both of these, let's say in my drawing over there, the top plate's the positive plate. So this one will look more like this, and this one will look more like this. I purposely try to draw the line density much higher on the right to indicate it's a stronger field. Now here's a common mistake, misconception. Um, if you look at, a, say, a point uh, halfway between the plates, Common misconception here is that, oh, okay, that total makes total sense that the electric field is stronger here because you're much closer to both plates. Well, remember that when we talk about 
uh, plates, we basically usually approximate them as infinitely long, and then it doesn't matter how close you are to the plates because the field is uniform anyway. So the field there is not stronger because you're closer to the plates. The field here must be stronger because there's more charge. Okay? So if the field is stronger here, there must be more charge creating it. So it looks like that. So again, if there's a stronger electric field being made by a uniform uh, plane, it indicates more charge making it. So notice this is all inferred. I'm not saying why this is occurring. I'm just saying, well, this must follow from this for whatever reason. So if there is more charge, but remember, our whole premise was the same voltage, right? So if we store more charge for the same voltage, well, we've just shown that this must imply more capacitance. So these two things right here, more charge at the same voltage must imply larger capacitance. That's been the best way that I can motivate this for you. I know that there's some of the some gaps in there. Um, and then I just want to kind of leave it at that. Okay. Um, so those are the two things that you can do so far anyway. We'll get to a way to soup up our capacitors in a, little, a little bit later. But those are the two things that you can do to improve your performance of your capacitor. You can make the plates bigger, or you can make them more close together. Those will both make it a better capacitor. Okay. Um, are there any questions on that? Okay, so there's one more thing we need to do um, before uh, we move on to uh, starting to actually construct these things. Uh, circuits and whatnot, um, we need to establish not only about charge storage, but energy storage. We mentioned that uh, along with this comes energy storage. So let's figure out what that is. Um, so here we have our plates initially. There's no charge whatsoever, they're both neutral. And as you can probably guess, there's no energy stored there either. Okay, there's no accessible stored energy. And let me draw kind of a sequence of events going to the right here of the charging process. Well, basically what we're doing is we're taking charge off of one plate and putting it on another. We're slowly, slowly creating a charge separation. Now, obviously, the battery is the pump that's doing that, but it doesn't really matter how we're doing that, because at the end of the day, the amount of energy we have stored should be uh, due to the properties of the capacitor, not the particulars of how that got done. So the very first thing we do is we take a negative, a, a positive charge, we take it off of one plate, put it on the other. Now this right here stores basically no energy. That positive charge that arrives at that plate has nobody to repel from, okay? So the energy, added energy here, is basically none. If we go over here to the very end, if you've already have a bunch of positive charges that are on there from previous uh, uh, trips, I guess, then this one, that one stores a lot of energy, right? So cramming that last positive charge on there, think about how many other positive charges are already there, and you're trying to shove it right next to them. So here, this charge, so the last charge, has the most potential energy stored. Okay? 
Think of it like the very first charge uh, you put on the, the top plate there. It's got the whole plate all to itself. And the last one is the hard one, because you're trying to put that positive charge where there's already a bunch of other positive charges that came before, right? And in fact, on this last one, Q, uh, the voltage difference is already built up to the voltage difference at, uh, of the battery at this point. So at this point, this one stores basically the most. So the last one, remember our good old formula Q times V, right? But let me point out that not every single charge had that situation. The ones on the beginning were easier to put on, and the ones at the end were the hardest to put on. They stored the most energy. So what should we do? If we wanted to use this formula as a whole, and we wanted to use uh, Q, capital Q meaning the total charge, right, everybody, so that's these guys. We cannot use the voltage drop at the end because that is way over counting the amount of energy we stored. If we just use the voltage at the end, well, that's basically saying that the charges have always been going across the voltage difference uh, the whole time, but they haven't. The voltage builds up with the charge, right? That's, it's these charges which are creating this voltage. So what we have to do, we have to use, if we're going to use the total charge, capital Q, we have to use the average voltage that was experienced. And that voltage built up from nothing to whatever it is at the end, right? It's the charges themselves that built this up. So, here's what I tell you. What was the average voltage experience from the beginning to the end? Well, it was halfway, okay? So the average voltage is actually going to be experienced was half the final. And for those of you that may be comfortable with this from math class, how do you know it's exactly halfway? Well, these are linearly proportional. And it means that um, any linear function, if you take the average, it's halfway between the endpoints. Okay? So the extra factor of 2 makes sure that we don't overcount. Because remember, this voltage difference was not in existence before. It was the charges themselves that caused it. Okay? We go from the early charges, which there's basically no potential energy stored yet, to the end, where the last drops of charge are the hardest to put on, and the average voltage difference was halfway. So here's our formula. We're done. The potential energy formula for how much energy is stored in a capacitor is one half times the charge, the eventual charge, and voltage. Okay. So if we compare that, of course, we have three forms of the power law. Let me put them in the order that I originally put them in, not that it matters. So we had three different forms of the power law for resistors. Um, and of course, that's not energy, it's power. That's the amount of energy for time, right? It turned out to be a more sensible question for a resistor, right? Because the resistor, there are always charges coursing through it. So a better question would be, what is the rate at which energy gets uh, transferred per time from electrical to heat, right? And we said, of course, that we had... This was more useful for series, because the current is always the same in series. And this one was we used because this was always in par this was in parallel and voltage is the same in parallel. So it's not that the other ones are wrong, but it's hard to make a mistake. Well, we're going to do the same thing with uh, capacitors. Here's our first form. And notice now it's not a rate, it's just the amount 
the amount of potential energy that's stored on a capacitor, so it's just straight up energy, potential energy. And where are we going to get the other two forms the same exact way we did before, right? We got these other two forms of the power law by subbing in Ohm's law, and now we're going to do the same by subbing in the equivalent of Ohm's law for a capacitor. So for instance, we could put in Q equals V times C, right? And get rid of Q, or we could solve for V and put in for, and get rid of the V. So let me give you what those are. Um, you could have one half Q squared over C, or you could have one half C V squared. So there's three different alternative forms. Why do you want to have three different forms of it around? Well, same reason. When we get the series in parallel, which I'm not going to do right now, um, we're going to find that some forms are easier to mess up and some are harder to mess up. Use the ones that are harder to mess up. Which one do you use for series? This one. How do I know? And this is again spoiling a little bit of the punchline of series and parallel caps, which we won't get to quite yet. Instead of I being the same, right, the flow of charge, it's going to be just charge. So instead of I, it's Q. Okay? So that's what, why we use that one. And then over here, we know that voltage is the same in parallel. Same thing here, voltage is the same in parallel. So I guess I can put the corresponding quantities, I can circle them. Flow of charge is the same in series, charge is the same in series. Voltage is the same in parallel, voltage is the same in parallel. Okay. okay any questions on that? Yeah. Um, I, as I mentioned, I'm going to push off series in parallel uh, because um, uh, I want to talk about stuff that is the, the homework is a harder, harder problems on the homework first. Okay, so I'm going to come back to series in parallel in a big way, but later on. Right now, I just wanted to have three different forms of the, the potential energy formula available. So let me come back to that later. Um, Okay, so what I want to skip to first, um, and this is, this, this, I think, the, one of the topics that people have trouble with on, on this unit, um, and uh, also I think your first lab after your exam will be on this, so I want to make sure I get to it, okay? Um, that's the timing of these things, okay? So how long does it take to put energy on these capacitors? How long does it take to get them off? Right now, there is no impediment to the flow. And so basically, right now, it's approximately instant uh, charging. So as the cur circuit currently stands, it will basically charge like that. And in fact, we've already had this discussion previously. We talked about that a, a conductor is an equipotential, right? So if you have a piece of conductor, you're not going to find one voltage on one end and another on the other end, right? One of the, I think in your mapping lab, right, you had that pair of salad tongs, right, and you touched all the different parts of the conductor and it's all the same voltage. That's what you have with conductors. Let me point out that this is all one contiguous piece of conductor, right? So this should very, very, very rapidly become the same voltage. So there's nothing really to stand in the way of the charge just surging almost instantaneously onto these plates until it's full. But, number one, there's no such thing really, as we've learned, as a truly perfect conductor, at least not at room temperature, no superconductors. There's always some resistance involved, right? And that resistance is going to get in the way of charging instantaneously. And, I should also point out that the fact that it might take time to charge is a feature, not a flaw. So this is the first time where we've had circuits where something will happen over time. So it's a way of introducing timing into a circuit. Any, electron, any electronic device that has some thing that has to happen, not instantaneously, but happen over time, 
a capacitor is involved. Okay? So for instance, your windshield wipers, right? Your windshield wipers, you want to be able to control the timing of them, right? There's a capacitor, capacitor that's used to do that. Okay? We're introducing something that will allow uh, the evolution of the circuit with time. So let's uh, start looking at those. And again, the way that we're going to introduce some timing into this is by introducing a resistor. So if you introduce one or more resistors, we know that current can't just surge through a resistor. It takes, uh, it, there's some uh, obstruction there. So we're looking at something called RC circuits. These are circuits that have both the capacitor that you're either trying to put energy onto or take it off, and then you have a resistor that stands in the way to prevent you from doing that instantaneously. Okay? I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the easier one and then move on to the harder one. This is going to be the discharging circuit. So the discharging circuit, at some point in the past, for, uh, I've managed to charge up a capacitor, and now I want to get the charge and energy off of it. So here's what I have. Plus Q, minus Q, and these are going to be the initial values. So I've charged it up at some point in the past, and now I want to use that energy. So I'm going to let these two re-equilibrate back to neutral, but I'm going to have them do it through a resistor. This is a capacitance of C and a resistance of R. So let's go ahead and start to kind of telegraphing the situation. Um, Q, um, let's see what happens with the charge on the capacitor, each plate. Let's see what happens to the voltage drop across the capacitor. Let's talk about what happens with the voltage drop across the resistor. And the current. Um, and potential energy, I guess. And I guess the power dissipated through the resistor as well. This is basically all the quantities that we might um, be interested in. All right. So the charge starts off at some initial value. But then what happens is these positive charges are not going to hang around near each other now that they have an escape route. And that escape route is, of course, that these positive charges can repel each other, flow, flow through the resistor, and wind up over here. But what happens when a positive charge flows from one plate and goes to the other? Well, they neutralize, right? And if we let all the charges do this, what's the eventual charge we're going to have on each plate? Zero. Zero. So this runs down from a charged plate to just two uncharged plates. There's no charge on either plate at the end. Now remember that as goes the charge on the plates, so goes the voltage, right? That's the whole deal with the capacitor is that the charges create the voltage. So if the charges go away, what happens to the voltage? You can't create a voltage difference with no charge, right? Remember, as goes Q, so goes B. So whatever the voltage difference is initially, whatever this is, V, C initial, eventually it goes to nothing. Okay, let's go to the resistor. Initially, why does anything flow? Of course, it's because this is the higher voltage region than this. So we really only have two equipotentials in this whole circuit, right? So initially, the voltage drop across the resistance is whatever it is, but these are really one and the same thing, right? 
If we drew one of our voltage waterfalls, it looks like this. These are one and the same thing at all times. So the voltage drop across the capacitor is the voltage drop across the resistor. Another way that you could do it is by doing a Kirchhoff's loop, like we talked about last time, right? Effectively, there's no difference between a, a, how you do a loop for a capacitor versus a battery, right? If you go from the lower voltage to the higher voltage terminal, you get a voltage gain. When you go with the current, you'll get a drop. So that looks like this. Plus Vc minus Vr equals zero, which of course is just another way of mathematically equivalent to that, okay? So really, it's a bit silly. These resistors are the same, or these voltages are the same. So these are actually, this is actually the same thing, right? When we talk about the voltage drop across the capacitor and the voltage drop across the resistor, we're talking about the same voltage difference, okay? Okay, so initially you have a voltage drop across the resistor, so are we going to get current flow when we first connect it? Yeah, so there's going to be an initial current, but at later on, when there is no voltage drop anymore, are we going to get current just for funsies? No, right? There's no motivation anymore to go across the uh, capacitor. Uh, or across the resistor, and then no, nothing will flow for free. And again, the reason I put these two next to each other is as goes one, so goes the other, Ohm's law. If you have a lot of voltage drop available across the resistor, a lot of current will flow. If you provide the motivation, current will flow in response. Likewise, in this case, the, as the voltage drop gets less, the current gets less, and at the end, the voltage drop is zero, so the current is zero, okay? So nothing flows at the end, because everything's done flowing, right? Once all of the positive charges have flowed from here to here, nothing happens anymore. So you can kind of think of it like this. If this is the voltage waterfall, the only difference between this and hooking it up to a battery is that a battery has an internal mechanism that can regenerate in, or I, that can um, create more uh, charge to uh, maintain the voltage difference. So if you have a 9 volt battery, for a long time it can stay 9 volts. And that's because of an internal chemical reaction that can maintain that. There's no chemical reaction going on here. So if you have charge, pre-existing charge, however much you've put on here, that's what creates the voltage difference, and as those charges flow off, the voltage difference drops. And so what happens here, is that this, this, this difference is always decreasing, okay? So it's like a time-evolving waterfall, okay? So think of it like a waterfall where the drop is made out of sand or something like that, and it get, get the sand eventually gets worn away and the waterfall goes away, okay? So once the charges have choke flow off, it's not an inexhaustible supply. Now obviously even with batteries that have internal chemical reactions, they only last for so long because they only have so much inside them to make that, uh, so many reagents inside to, to maintain that. But here a capacitor, you just have access to the charge that have been put on there, that's all you have, and the charge flows off, and that's kind of it. Um, okay, so let's talk about potential energy. Obviously whatever amount of energy you have stored flows off, what becomes of the energy that was stored on the capacitor? Heat, right? It gets sweated out through the resistor. So it gets sweated out through the environment. It does it more at the beginning when the current is larger. And then, of course, the rate at which the energy is get, gets dumped to the environment at the end goes to zero because, of course, there's nothing to dump anymore, right? So basically, in this circuit, everything runs down to zero, and at the end, you have a neutral hunk of stuff. You have two neutral plates connected by a resistor. So 
hopefully, this is why this is one of the easier case to start with, because everything runs down from whatever initial values it's been set up as, all the way down to zero. And now all we're going to do is take a look at the equations for this, okay? Because as we will find out, this is not a steady or linear progression. At first, you can imagine these positive charges are very, very, very excited at the prospect of repelling each other, right? So we get, have that it happens rapidly at first, but then once there starts to be a lot less crowding here, that slows down to a trickle, okay? So we have that a lot happens at first, so we have a larger rate toward the beginning, and then it gets progressively to be a slower rate by the time we approach the end. It's not a smooth progression. It actually turns out that the rate is proportional to the amount of charge. So if you have a lot of charge left, the rate at which that charge will flow off is larger. And if the amount of charge you have left is very small, the rate at which it flows off is very small as well. It slows down to a trickle. Now you can actually show mathematically that any time the rate of the <clears throat> discharging or whatever, the rate is proportional to the amount you have left, this leads to a particular mathematical <clears throat> expression, which is called an e e exponential. Okay? <coughs> this, conceptually, the rate being tied to the amount leads naturally to what's called an exponential function. That's why they're so prevalent in nature. There's so many different applications of, of exponential functions, this just being one of them. It happens any time that the rate is tied to the amount itself. So the rate is high when the amount is high, the rate is low when the amount is low, okay? Now obviously this is in calculus class, so I'm gonna have to, sh to basically say this statement will lead to this equation, and let me just give you the equation. So this is an equation, which you will find on your equation sheet. You can just use it. You don't have to derive it. All I'm going to do is I'm going to take this equation, and I'm going to talk about its features, especially for those of you that may not be that comfortable with exponentials. Um, let me um, review a little bit. Now before I even tackle this thing with all the bells and whistles, let me just remind you of good old y equals e to the minus x, which is probably how you've seen exponentials. Um, is there anyone who hasn't seen this here? How many people have seen this in math class? Okay, good. So, what does this look like? It looks like this. Y versus X. It drops off steeply at first, and then of course it gets, it, it gets uh, closer and closer to uh, zero. Y gets closer and closer to zero, but it never really gets there until you wait forever, right? This is what's called an asymptote. Um, what's the value right here, by the way? What's the value of y? It's uh, 1, right? y at, so if you take e to the minus 0, well, anything to 0 is 1, right? And by the time you get to x equals uh, infinity, <coughs> Well, that's 1 divided by a gigantic number, so that's basically 0, right? So this function basically just curves starting at a y value of 1, but you have to go all the way to x equals infinity before it drops down truly to y equals 0. Is that uh, familiar? Okay. Um, now, one of the things, of course, is that if you want to talk about how rapidly this thing falls off, um, you can't say how long does it take to get to zero, that the answer is always infinity. So one of the other things that you can talk about um, is what's e to the minus one? So what, what happens when we're at x equals one? Well, 
That's 1 over e. Um, e, this is a number, right? It's a transcendental number. It never repeats and never ends, right? Its value just goes on and on, okay? There's the first however many digits. If you want to impress somebody, you can remember the 2.7, and it's 1828 twice, and then a 459045 triangle, okay? And that's all I have memorized, okay? <laughs> so it's just shy in physics, okay? We say it's just shy of three, okay? That's close enough. So this is approximately one third. The exact number is, is about 0.37, roughly, okay? Or I shouldn't say exact number, but it's very close to about 0.37. So at this point, what happens is you're at 0.37 of your previous value, and you've dropped, of course, 0.63. So if you start at 1 and you drop 0.63, you're at 0.37. This is often the way that uh, exponential, exponentials are judged against each other because, of course, if you want to talk about how long does it take to drop to zero, the answer is always forever. But we can talk about the 37%, 63% benchmark, okay? Now, when you express it in terms of percentages, it sounds kind of weird. Why would you want to say, six, where, why would you want to talk about the 63, 37% benchmark? Well, of course, it's not really so odd because 37% is 1 over e. So that's when the original value you started at has been cut by e. Okay? So those are the different features of the exponential that I'm going to rely on here because my function here for the charge is just bells and whistles uh, with that. So let me draw my charging function. This is a charge as a function of time. And by the way, for those of you that may not be comfortable with function notations, this is charge as a function of time. I don't mean charge times time, okay? Like that's like in math class, if you see function of x, you think it's f times x. That's, no, that's not what it is, okay? So this is charge as a function of time. So first of all, uh, the exponential is multiplied by q initial in the front. That just simply makes sure that instead of starting at 1, it'd be weird to just always start at 1 coulomb, we start off at q initial. And then it goes from there. So we see that the charge, whatever its initial value is, it'll be excited to, to run down at first, and then it'll slow to a trickle later. That's what we kind of said should happen. So, let's talk about what tau is. This other variable here, obviously we have kind of the exponentials that has some stuff going over there. So let's ask what happens at t equals tau. If I plug it into the formula, q at t equals tau, well that's q initial e to the minus tau over tau, and that's e to the minus 1. So tau represents the time at which the initial charge has been cut by e. So in other words, it is 37%, 0.37 to 37% of its initial value. So when time tau has passed, we have 37% of our initial charge because we've lost 63%. So tau is a way of controlling the fact that not every circuit is exactly the same. Tau determines what is the time that this particular circuit takes to reach the 63%, 37% benchmark. Okay? And that's how we judge all of our exponentials 
Because if we asked how long does it take to discharge completely, the answer is actually infinity. We'd have to wait forever for the last tiny little drop of charge to fall off. So we can't do it that way. So instead what we do is we ask how long does it take to reach this particular benchmark, okay? So tau is the time it takes to reach this 63, 37% benchmark. And this is where I'm going to have to tell you, this again falls out of the derivation, maybe for those of you that are in the supplement, maybe uh, Adam will do it for you, I'm not sure. Um, but you can find out, the thing that it determines how long it takes to reach this benchmark is actually determined by the resistance that you're discharging through and the capacitance that you're discharging from. Believe it or not, an ohm times a farad is actually a second, okay? If you work out the units of ohms times farads, those are composite units, I think they're even composite units upon composite units, but if you work it all out, it comes out to be in seconds. So, I guess uh, Usain Bolt runs the 100 meter dash in about, uh, what, 9 ohm farads? I think it's about right. Okay. So, because I force I just pulled this out of thin air, let me motivate for you why this makes sense. If the resistance that you're discharging through is larger, it takes longer to hit this benchmark. Does that make sense? Yeah, you're discharging through a more obnoxious obstacle, so it's going to take longer. So you have to discharge through a larger obstruction, discharge through larger obstruction, so it takes longer to hit your benchmark. It takes longer to hit benchmark. It also tells us that if the capacitance is larger, it also takes longer to hit your benchmark. So why does that make sense? Well, if you're discharging a really good storage device, it's not that bothered by having all this charge on it, right? So these charges are hanging out here luxuriously, not really that bothered by being near each other. If you had a tiny, if you had a capacitor that was really bad, and all those charges were really penned up in there, they'd want to rush off. But if the capacitor is better, it's not that bothered by discharging. And so it's going to take longer, and of course, again, to hit your benchmark. So you're, here you're discharging a better storage device. So those are the two things that go into whether it's going to take longer or shorter to hit this particular benchmark. Are you discharging a better capacitor through a larger obstruction? Well, it's going to take longer. So this is how we judge circuits off each other. Maybe another circuit it looks like this. It also is an exponential. It also takes forever to empty completely, so that's not a useful point. Everything takes forever to empty completely. But it takes much longer before we hit the 63-37% benchmark. Why is that? Maybe you're discharging through a larger resistor, maybe you're discharging a larger capacitor, maybe both. For some reason, R times C is larger, so it's going to take longer to hit this benchmark. Okay? So this allows for the fact that even though everything takes forever to empty completely, some things will empty very slowly uh, in comparison, right? At every point, the red line is higher than the black line, which means that at any given time point, there's always more charge on the, the red capacitor than the other one, right? The line that represents another circuit, this red line that represents another circuit, it's always more full at any given time. 
Okay. Um, so that's the first function. Um, and I guess let me give you a free brief, uh, few brief words on how you might solve it. So one of the typical homework questions might be, like just as an example, uh, what is the time it takes to uh, be, uh, say, 1% of the initial charge? That might be like a, a proxy way of asking how long it takes to empty because, of course, it takes forever to empty completely. But let's say when it has 1% of the char charge remaining, for our purposes, that's close enough to empty. So how might we do that? Let's take the equation. First of all, work smarter, not harder. Okay? You want the charge to be 1% of the initial. So that's what goes in on that side. If someone expresses it as a percentage of the initial, they've done you a favor, because check this out. If you put in the other side, the initial charge cancels. So now we solve for t. Well, we have the time, but it's in the exponential. Does anyone remember the inverse function to the exponential? What did you do? What is it? Log. log. Which, which log? LN. Natural log. That's right. Natural log of e to the whatever is pulls it down from the exponent, right? Those are inverse functions, just like tan and inverse tan, or square and square root, right? You get back to square one, right? So I take the natural log of both sides, and then over here, I manage to pull down from the, um, the exponent. Now, one reminder, when you're taking the natural log, make sure that you have the exponential cleanly, okay? It shouldn't be e to the x plus one, right? It shouldn't be like, this is not what you want to do, okay? Don't do that. You need to cleanly isolate the exponential before you take the natural log. So I'm, I'm home free here. I get t equals negative tau ln of 0 0.1. You can put in whatever uh, tau is. That's uh, just r times c. If you're bothered by the negative sign in the front, you think, what? Negative time? It's not negative. Natural log of 0.01 is also negative. So that negative cancels this negative. No worries. You have a positive time. OK, so that's one, just a little reminder on how to manipulate natural logs. Okay, um, so that's the charge function. Um, and with that already, we can go ahead and figure out another function. Because once you have the charge function, multiply it by c and you get your voltage function. So you're good to go. So remember, as goes Q, so goes VC. These two are stuck together. They only differ by a constant. So if I want the voltage as a function of time, I take the charge as a function of time and just divide by C. So I don't need to give you every single function. I only need to give you a few of them, and then the rest of them fall right out. So let me go ahead and put that in. Um, that is going to be Q initial, E to the minus T over tau, and then I'll put the C with this one. What's that Q initial over C? So if the voltage in general is Q over C, what's Q initial over C? It's V initial. So the voltage function across the capacitor, that also is a dying exponential. It starts off at whatever the initial value is and then just dies off. Looks exactly the same. Okay? If you want to draw it, it looks like this. That's the initial. And then it dies off with time. Just like we said it would. We've got the first two down. We've got this checked, we've got this checked. 
All right. Oh, and we actually have one more. Uh, we can do the potential energy function. Um, the potential energy function, um, we said that that was one half, uh, well, let's say, let's say one half CV squared. That's probably the easiest one. Because then it's one half times C times the voltage function we just got squared. So what is that? That's one half C V initial squared exponential What's this quantity in the front? One half C V initial squared. That's P E initial. And we get, once again, some kind of exponential function. The fact that it has a 2 in it doesn't really matter. It still dies down to, to 0. The fact that there's a 2 in the denominator does affect uh, the, the, uh, what tau means. But um, the general gist is still the same. So we've got PE. We're done with that. And then, for the other three that we haven't yet talked about, all of those, the, the charge is not involved, but the current is. Okay, so here I'm going to have to give you a second function to tell you what goes on with the current. And again, this is sort of pulled out of thin air for you guys, but same thing. So those are the two functions that I'm going to give you, the charge and the current. The current, also an exponential, also runs down to zero. Same deal. Current starts from the initial value. It runs down to zero. And when you have t equals tau, that's your 37%, 63% benchmark. And then from that, everything else will fall as well. So I just gave you the current function, so that's done. And then, remember, Ohm's law says, as goes the current, so goes the voltage. So if you want the voltage function, you take the current function and just multiply it by r. So let me do that. I'll throw it in there. Let me throw the uh, r toward the beginning. I can group all the constants together besides the exponential. What's I initial times R? It's V initial across the resistor, which again, I'm not really bothering to label because in this particular circuit, the voltage, there's only one voltage. We already said right here, these voltages are the same thing. We get the same function as over here. So the voltage we already knew ran down to ran it down to zero. And then if you want the power law, like well, guess what? Power equals I squared times R. You just put it in there, same thing. Okay? So you can see if I am gonna be willing to give you two of the exponentials, Q and I, all the rest of them just fall out. You can do any of the other ones you want. Okay? So we've done them all now. They're all exponentials, they all decay to zero from their initial values, that's kind of it. All right. Are there any questions on this? Okay, so I guess in the next five minutes, let me uh, see how much headway I can make with the charging one. Okay. So you guys will be trying both of these out in lab uh, for the next lab experiment, which will be a week from Tuesday, a week from your exam. Um, and so I want to get you guys prepped up with plenty of notice. Let me see how far I can make it with the charging circuit. Capacitor that is initially empty. 
So, I guess I should write these down. Let me see. Let me see if I can do them in the same order. Uh, Q, B, C, B, R, I, T, E, and T. So let's uh, make some predictions here. The capacitor is going to start off as empty, and then it's going to end up as full, at least as full as this battery can make it, right? The energy stored on it will go from nothing to, how, to full, whatever the, um, this battery is capable of making it. But it won't happen instantaneously, and it won't happen instantaneously because there's a resistor in the way. It doesn't matter if you put it on this side or this side, because remember that the entire system senses what's present. So the resistor is a bottleneck on either side that will prevent it from charging instantly. Okay. Um, what happens with the voltage across the capacitor? Well, remember that these two stick together. Whatever happens with one, it happens with the other. One grows, the other grows. So what's the initial voltage drop across the capacitor when it's empty? Zero. Zero. And how much voltage is it possible to get across by the end? Battery. The battery, right? The battery is the thing that's going to be charging it. So, um, and I guess let me go ahead and also remind you that these two always go together. So this, the resistor and capacitor are in series. So there's actually going to be um, three distinct equipotential regions in this circuit. This one, let me label it as lowercase a. This one, which is my lowercase b. And this one, which is my lowercase c. And here's what's going to happen. If the battery sets a fixed amount of voltage difference from top to bottom, And we can drop from regions A to B to C, first across the resistor and then across the capacitor. But this voltage waterfall is going to evolve with time. And let me give away the punchline. I'll come back to this next time. This voltage difference uh, and this voltage difference are not constant. We just saw that the battery, as it charges, it takes more voltage drop. So this is actually going to have to increase. Well, if that increases, then it crowds out the other one. So this is going to decrease. So this middle step is actually going to drift. And it turns out that it drifts. It starts off at the bottom and then winds up all the way at the top. So B starts off aligned at the bottom with C and winds up aligned with A at the top. And we'll take a look at that in more detail. Let's uh, leave it uh, there for today. We'll pick up on uh, Tuesday morning. <laughs>